if if we would come to have a seat, please. Good morning. Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church. I can look out and I can see visitors that have come to be a part of our service today. I can see members. I can see old members. But our visitors, for our visitors that don't know what's going on today, today is a day we've set aside for our Pastor Appreciation Day. Except this year it's a little bit different. Just last July, Brother Dwayne celebrated being here at Bethel Baptist for 20 years. That's, yes, yes, thank you, thank you. We thought that was, we thought that's quite an accomplishment. And so this pastor appreciation, we're gonna, we're gonna put the emphasis on that 20 years because we think that just like when y'all gave the applause, that's a big milestone. We'll find out also that uh, Brother Dwayne is a big part of this church's history. Now, that's going all the way back to 1959, 58, and that time. I had a theme. <laughs> well, he, he was only a few years old back then, but <laughs> hey, brother, I'm trying. <laughs> I had a theme for this, for this particular pastor appreciation, and it was get to know your pastor, which you're going to have that chance here later on to ask him those questions. But Two of the individuals that helped me put this on called me and uh, had talked to one of them off and on putting this together. He says, he said, I don't know if I can do it. He said, there's just not enough time. And so there was another one that came to me and he said, well, I, I want to show this and I want to show this and I want to do this. He said, but there's just not enough time. So our theme for this pastor appreciation is there's not enough time. Because, <laughs> well, in, in 20 years, a lot of things happened. And so we looked over that 20 years, and we thought, well, we'd like to show this, we'd like to do this, but then something else would come up. So it's, it's impossible to show what our pastor has done in, a, in the time allotted for the 20 years that he has been here. <laughs> and, again, the emphasis will be on that. We're going to find out later on some history not on the church, but we're going to find out some things about our pastor that a lot of our new members may not know, and a lot of our old members may not know. And here's one right here. I, 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 I call these in the beginning, but for those that don't realize that there was a time when Brother Dwayne was not only the pastor of Bethel Baptist Church, but he was the adult Sunday school teacher, and he was the song leader. He did all three of those. I helped out with the invitation and here and there, but there was a time when Brother Dwayne carried out all three of those offices. He would teach the adult Sunday school, and then he would lead singing on Sunday morning. Now his pattern was he'd get up here with his guitar, but then he would, that night he'd go over to the piano. But there was a time when our pastor fulfilled all those offices at Bethel Baptist Church. Our first thing that we're gonna do this morning was put together a, a video that we'd like to show you. Now, originally this video was going to be about 10 minutes long, but the person that put that together called me and he says, I ain't got enough time. There's not enough time to show what I want to show. And so you'll have to blame me. I gave, gave these two men that, that allotted time, and, and so we want to do that right now. Uh, is the video ready? We'd like to show you all this video, and again, it lasts for about 14 minutes, but this is some times that, that Brother Dwayne has uh, spent with the folks here through the years, and we, we thought, and T Timothy's really did a good job at putting this together. So let's take a walk. song the wall of prayer There are 
Is that you, Buzz? Is that you? Shh, I'm in disguise. You're in disguise? Yes. I'm just still a little confused as to why you're dressed up like this. Well, you, you, you see, I, I couldn't dress up like a bug, so I figured I'd dress up like Aunt Nelda. Well, ants probably don't understand who ants are. Most ants don't have ants and certainly don't want ants. Even if there was an ant ant, I'm not sure that it even looks like an ant. <laughs> well, that does kind of make sense because, you know, I, I never thought that Aunt Nelda looked much like a bug anyway. <laughs> so, kids, I'll see y'all later, okay? All right. Bye, Aunt Nelda. Look see ya. Goodbye, bye. bye. As we go along today, I want to thank those that helped put this together and the bulletins uh, that you've got for this service was for, from Sister Cindy. I want to thank her so much for that. We wasn't expecting that. And, uh, it's the little things that, that really help out a lot of times, so thank you for that, Sister Cindy. Uh, we felt that it was important that you know some of the history of Bethel Baptist Church. and. Again, we, we would say that Brother Dwayne is part of that history, probably a bigger part than 
than uh, people would really think about. But I want to read you a little bit, and then we're going to have the children come up and sing for him. Sunday afternoon, April 12th, the Neal family, the Graham family, the Carr family, the Smith family, and the Casey family met with the members of Rogers Baptist Church and organized this mission at Bethel Temple Missionary Baptist Church. That was the name of this church. It was later changed to Bethel Baptist Church. January 1959, Bethel bought the property at 210 Tyler with the first payment of $180. May 1959, the larger house was moved to the back of the property to make room for a parking lot and later a new building. June 1959, a new building fund was started for the auditorium, which we set right now at $4.77. Saturday, August 8th, 1959, Rockwall Lumber Company <coughs> delivered $1,970 worth of lumber and a new building was started. After completed, Sunday school service was held in the old house in the back, which is right back here right now. And we also felt that it was important that we read the pastors that have served here at Bethel since 1959. Howard Neal, seven years. Bill Hitt, one year, four months. Ed Perry, three years, four months. Jerry Richardson, one year, four months. Don Burns, seven years. Ed Perry, another two years. Chuck Bigler, four months. Jim Dodd, two years. Harold Spillers, six months. Leo Watkins, seven years, five months. Larry Neighbors, six years. Brother Dwayne Crane, from July 1997 until present. And for 60 years, 60 years, these men have led this church as the Holy Spirit led them. The history of Bethel Baptist Church has been one of standing on the promises of God's word and seeing souls saved. Their children here at Bethel Baptist Church and through the years has always been an important part of Brother Dwayne's life, as you've seen in these, in these pictures. Uh, again, there's not enough time. But I've seen him wrestle with these kids over the years out here and actually put a dent in one of the cars out here. So brother, the, the kids have always been a, a, a big part of, of Brother Dwayne's ministry, and so we're going to ask them now if they'll come up and present the song that they have for him. Also, while they're, while they're coming up here, I'd like to thank Sister Jenny and Sister Cindy for their time they put in to practice this song and Sister Kathy Finnegar for supplying this song. Thank you. Thank you. Nope, that's not it, sorry. You answered the call and obeyed God's command. He sent you here, we know you're in his hands. Your message from the word touches our very soul. We've seen your faithfulness. We want you to know. Pastor, we love you. We appreciate all you do. God sees the sacrifice. You made for Jesus Christ. 
Dear Pastor, thank you, Pastor, for all you do, for your work, your kindness, and your guidance, too. Your point to Jesus, your walk the walk. We usually listen when you talk. We think you're special. We think you're great. We'll pray for you every day. I'm in October. No, really, Pastor, we got your back. Now we'll cut you a little slack. We truly think, think you're the best, and thank you for all you invest. God bless you, Pastor. Again, these kids have always been a very big part of Bethel Baptist Church, and uh, most of them are my knot-headed grandchildren, but uh, <laughs> we felt that also, too, you needed to know something about Dwayne Crane's life and his education. 
a lot of his education we won't cover but except the main part and that's when he accepted Christ as his savior and the work that he would do after that good to see you brother Bob glad you came in also I want to acknowledge just a few people sister Jackie Sandoval uh, brother Walter Patton hey Walter he was a member here years ago and uh, we want to thank them for being here Brother Dwayne joined the United States Air Force in 1977 and served till 1981. He attended East Texas State University and Baptist Bible College. He surrendered, pardon, Arlington Baptist College, excuse me. He surrendered to preach in 1970. That's where the education would really start right there. Became licensed to preach in 1971 and was in fact ordained in 1983 when he would start pastoring a church. He studied, he studied under several people. There were several people that was important in his life. And two of those were Brother D.D. Ramsey and Brother David Meeks and others that have influenced him in his, in his walk for the Lord and his ministry. Dwayne Crane was born to George and Catherine Crane on December 3rd, 1956. They attended Rogers Baptist Church of Garland, Texas, and joined Bethel Baptist Church in Rockwall, Texas, when he was only a small child. As a matter of fact, he would have been about three years old. They helped build the very building that we're sitting in right now. That's, if you look in your bulletin, we was going to go back and, and do some ties that tied, brother, that tied Brother Crane and his family to Bethel Baptist Church. In 1959, they helped build this original building. They were members here. Come on in, Brother Marks. We got a seat for you, Brother. <laughs> At the age of 13 years old, Brother Dwayne realized that he needed something more for his life, and he accepted Christ as his Savior. At an old-fashioned church in Mount Calvary. Mount Calvary and Bethel Baptist Church is also tied together because there are folks here that are going to Bethel that are member, were members of, Bethel, of uh, Mount Calvary. The Turbyvilles and several others. Those churches have been tied together for a long time because of those members and Bethel Baptist. Brother Crane was called to pastor his first church at Bible Baptist Church in Andrews, Texas. He was at that church for 22 months when he felt led to accept one in Boyd, Texas, and he was only there for 10 months. You have to understand at this time, there were three young children, there was a family that was on the road. Uh, Brother Dwayne worked several jobs other than, than his pastorship that he was doing. A matter of fact, in, when he started pastoring this church, he worked a full-time job in North Dallas for four years before he went full-time here at Bethel. He had a lot of driving to do. And uh, uh, what people don't also realize is, is once he went, once he came here to Bethel, he only came here to fill in. But there was one other church I want to I wanna tell you about, and that was, uh, let me find it here, Calvary Baptist Church in Mesquite, Texas. Now, Brother Crane went to that church and was satisfied right there. And a matter of fact, he, uh, I imagine his feelings like we all do, we go to church, we don't ever want to leave, but at that time he went to this church and was satisfied. He was the adult son, or senior adult Sunday school teacher at Berean Baptist Church, uh, taught, high, taught junior high singles at Berean Baptist Church, but still, you have, the thing about Brother Dwayne Crane is you have to remember when he surrendered to the ministry, there was a desire to preach and there was a desire to pastor. And I believe with all my heart that these, that these three churches that he served at prior to coming to Bethel, I believe God was tutoring him for this position right here. And you'll never make me look, think of any different. Uh, he's told us before and he will tell you himself that the men that that inspired him was Brother D.D. D. Ramsey, Brother Meeks, but also, looking through my notes here, Brother Johnny Fryer. I don't want to forget anybody. And again, not enough time. Uh, when, we, when we put this together, like I said, we were, we were trying to cover all aspects of Dwayne's life. We just didn't, 
We just didn't have, a, have time to do that. But I do want to let you know that other than his education and his time here at Bethel, our pastor has always been, if you'll see in your bulletin, a competitive man. Now, uh, I say that because I've experienced that firsthand on the golf course. Uh, but make no mistake about it, if you want to play volleyball, he'll play. If you want to pitch horseshoes, he'll play. If you want to play 42, he'll play. Now, him and all these other folks that play 42, I don't even get into that because it's just something I don't understand. But now on the golf course, I do. And don't think just because Brother Dwayne plays golf, he ain't into throwing a golf club in frustration. <laughs> because that happens. That happens. We went to two Ranger games together, Brother Dwayne and I, and both of them, both of them were walk-off wins for the Rangers. You just don't get any better than that. It's, it's hard to go to a ball game just to see a walk-off, but to experience two with the pastor, that was a great memory for me. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Brother Gary and Brother Scott Leonard to prepare. Uh, we wanted to do a question and answer, and I'm going to ask Brother Dwayne if he would to come up and get right in this chair. Now, Brother Scott, now, <laughs> where's the, you got the lapel mic on? No. Oh, here it is. While he's getting that, are we, one of my favorite programs to get home from school to watch was Carol Burnett, and she would do this question and answer thing, and they would ask her, well, why do you tug on your ear? And she said, well, my children know it's time to go to bed when they see me tug on my ear. So I thought it would be a good idea to find out some things about our pastor and give you that chance also. Uh, I see Sister Nancy sitting out there. Here's your chance. If he was little and he got and somebody, some money came up missing at y'all's house and you suspect him, now's the time to answer. That way we'll all find out. We, we didn't have any money growing up. But we want to give you that chance to ask Brother Crane what you want to ask him. And uh, I, I thought to myself, well, if they ask him a, a biblical question and he hadn't studied, I know what he's going to say. So he's going to say, well, I hadn't studied that. Get back to me later. Amen. And... Uh, <laughs> But here's, we want you to, to ask him what you would like to find out about him. Uh, I've told you a few things. Uh, Brother Dwayne coached his boys in, in baseball. Come on in, Sister Mark. We're waiting on you anyway. <laughs> There's many things about our pastor that are wonderful, and now is your chance to find out about those. Uh, Brother Gary and Brother Scott Leonard have these microphones. Now, the we reason they've got the microphones is because we're recording this service, and we've got some people that ain't able to be here. And we want them to be able to hear your questions, but we also want to be able to, to get them a copy of this DVD so they can watch it because they're not able to be here. So we're going to turn it loose, Brother Scott. If you'll come over here, all you have to do is raise your, question, your hand if you've got a question. We know some folks do. And well, I knew you did now. <laughs> I haven't studied. <laughs> That's not the answer. <laughs> yes. Okay. A couple of weeks ago, you told us in one of your sermons that you had to go to the principal's office. And my question is about this, but it's got eight parts. <laughs> so would you like to have them all at one time and then study on them, or would you like for me to give them to you one at a time? Just do single fire. Okay. Why were you sent to the principal's office? Because I returned and retaliated when a kid shot a spitwad at me and I shot it back and I got caught. Same spitwad? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, what did he do to you for that? He walked around behind me and he told me he, he had, first of all, he said this, and the sis, sis is sitting here, he said, 
Nancy Crane I know, Ronald Crane I know, David Crane I know, Steve Crane I know, Brenda Crane, Gary Crane, Larry Crane, who are you? Because <laughs> I was in ninth grade and that's the first time I'd ever been to the principal's office uh, in, in middle school there. And so I told him who I was and he said, and the classes, and he, he had already looked at my record and everything, he walked around behind me and God is my witness. He walked behind me with a paddle and he, he went one, two, three, just about that hard, said, get out of here, I don't ever want to see you again, and he didn't. <laughs> now, how old were you? I was in ninth grade. Yeah, but that doesn't tell me how old you were. You could have been 25. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she does have a point. she got a point. She's got a point. I am a crane. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, ninth grade, I would have been um, uh, somewhere right around 14, 15, maybe. Something like that. <laughs> that was two. That was two weeks ago. <laughs> okay. Was that why you closed your message at eleven fifteen a couple of weeks later? Well, I learned a long time ago. The Holy Spirit said, or I said to the Holy Spirit, "Fill my mouth with worthwhile stuff and nudge me when I've said enough." It's a shame he doesn't do that more often. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, some, sometimes you just got to drill deeper and longer because some th things are just harder to drill into. <laughs> Does your principal know that you text while you drive? No, ma'am. <laughs> do the police know that you text while you drive? No, ma'am. Okay. Well, I won't turn you in this time. Right. <laughs> and is that why... My wife does. <laughs> <laughs> is that why you say you're going to close the message with this and then you don't close? I'm still, I'm still drilling. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's why you say, I'm not going to say anything bad about this, but you say it anyway. Well, because it wasn't bad, evidently. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I went to Rogers Baptist Church when I was a little girl, and I don't remember seeing you there. Yeah, but the church started in 1936. <laughs> <laughs> Rogers started many years before me. <laughs> I have a quick question oh. for you. During that video, there was several times when it showed our vacation Bible school, mm -hmm. and it showed very many different characters. And uh, I was just wondering that during high school times or any time after, have you ever had any acting lessons? I have never had acting lessons, no. <laughs> and it shows, doesn't it? <laughs> Straight from the horse's uh, mouth. I, Amen. I was in um, um, s several plays. Um, you know, I was in uh, three, two or three plays while I was in high school. Uh, I played, uh, you know, a hobo one time. I, I'm trying to remember some others, but <laughs> yeah. And uh, but but as far as acting, I took speech and one third place at Rotary Club, and my my notes were blank. Did, didn't have any any notes at all. Oh, amen. It, uh, we uh, we like the way you act around here. So uh. we just <laughs> <laughs> to to kind of follow up with that, would would you then say that acting like a fool comes natural to you when I'm around you? <laughs> In the video, and all the pictures we saw of you, only once did I see you had hair. What happened? I came here. <laughs> 20, 20 years ago, I had hair. One service, I walked in the back door, and as I came around the corner, Brother George and Sister Barbara were sitting there, and Sister Barbara said, Brother Dwayne's getting gray. 
And I was just glad that it was gray and not, she didn't say, he's getting bald. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's it definitely coming. Anyone else? I had a spit one worse. I spit it through a straw. You were in the service? Yes. But I thought you were in the Air Force. Yes. <laughs> the elite service. You wouldn't understand that. you and Sister Brenda married, and can you tell us where that took place? Was you in the Air Force at the time? And yes, sir. I, I, went and, I went in the Air Force January of 77. I came home one weekend, and that's when I met her. Five weeks later, lacking one day, we were married, um, and that was on November the 26th, 1977. She primed me for that day. So, no, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> It was November the 26th, 1977. We were married at Victory Baptist Church there in, uh, um, in Rowlett. In fact, uh, my sister and uh, her husband were uh, at that church there at that time also, and her father-in-law, Roy Gilliland. In fact, Roy and, and Roy actually did our wedding 40 years ago. Roy Sr. and Roy Jr. performed our wedding. Yes. Yes, I said I'd do again 25 years later there at Victory Baptist Church. I still do. <laughs> you know me, Pastor. I always got to say something. There you go. Why are you always picking on me? <laughs> Some people are just easy pickings. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. I'm telling you, that's easy. You got out light, brother. <laughs> you got out light. At this time, we're I'm gonna ask Brother Gary to take the service over to, we're gonna take up our offering. Uh, but first, I, I wanna thank a few more people. Today after our service, we'll have dinner next door and I wanna thank the Mitchells, Brother Ted and Sister Patsy and Brother Gary Cothran for cooking our main course. Uh, so if you, if you enjoy the dinner today, go say go say something to them, please. Also, for uh, Sister Frost, when you go over to the fellowship hall, you'll see our decorations over there. Thank you so much for that, sis. And also, again, for Sister Laura and Tara and others that helped put this together. That's always the hardest part. You can you can plan the stuff, but but once you start putting it together, you need folks like that that that'll help you do so. And so, thank y'all for that. Uh, this time we'll turn this over so service over to Brother Gary. Right. Let's not forget to thank Brother Billy for all his uh, efforts. <laughs> for all his reminders. <laughs> all right. We're gonna we're gonna sing a song. We're going to have you stand, turn and shake hands with your neighbors. We're going to receive a morning offering, and then we have a special after that. All right, number 54. Number 54 in the blue hymn. I'll fly away. Number 54. Number 54. I'm glad morning when this life 
remain standing for prayer, if you will, asking God's blessing on our offering this morning. I'd like to ask Brother John, if you would, to word our prayer, please, sir. Brother John. Amen. You may be seated. Bob, it's good to see you uh, this morning. Amen. We've been praying for you. And I know God's blessing. He's going to come sing for us this, at this time. So, Brother Bob, come on and sing. Uh, I want to say a word. I have to always say a word. <laughs> advertisement uh, I just want to say thank you everyone for all the prayers that you said for sister Joanne uh, she uh, 
her spirits are good. And uh, that's, that's a good thing because there was a point where they weren't, she was not doing well. And uh, it seems like it's been a long time ago since she was diagnosed, but actually it was one month ago yesterday that uh, she was diagnosed with the cancer. So, and uh, they're changing up her regimen. They're going to add some more chemotherapy on top of what she was supposed to have. And uh, she's been a real trooper. And uh, she always talks about our church here. She just really immensely misses that and uh, I know that uh, we I know and she knows that someday she'll be back that's that's what we're what we're anticipating so the name of the song is uh, all because of God's amazing grace Amazing grace, oh how sweet the sound that saved a poor sinner like me. Though once I was lost, yet now I am found. Though I was blinded, now I see. Because of God's amazing grace Because on Calvary's mountain He took my place And someday, some glorious morning I will see Him face to face It's all because of God's great grace We'll praise our Redeemer and King. We'll tell how His mercy for sin did atone. Through countless ages, the song we'll sing. And it's all because of God's amazing grace. On Calvary's mountain, he took my place. And today, some glorious morning, I will see him face to face. Look, because of God's amazing grace. And it's all because of God. our speakers if they would to go ahead and make their way to the stage uh, just making sure I haven't forgot anybody here all those that provided pictures for our video today thank you uh, for our visitors that come in late this is our pastor appreciation service except this year it marks 20 years that brother Dwayne has pastored Bethel Baptist Church we felt that that was that was the emphasis that we wanted to put on our service today. The five men that you see coming up here are, uh, and Brother Dwayne Crane have many things in common, whether it be current events, politics, or whatever, but the one thing that they have in common that you could throw all those others out is the preaching of God's Word and the teaching of God's Word. Uh, I was 
told a long time ago by our pastor many years ago that he's responsible for who gets behind this desk and brings God's word. And I wanted to tell those men that story this morning before we got started, but I just didn't have a chance to let them know just how he feels about them standing here. These, these men that, have, that, that help out up here, that are standing behind me, if I can say it this way, at times they help hold Brother Dwayne's arms up, if you will. These men allow Brother Dwayne to have a break on occasion, vacation. But that, that common bond with preaching God's word is what they hold together. And so I ask these men to find a scripture of their choice and come up and talk a few minutes about how that applied to our pastor. Brother Don Bodie uh, made another suggestion that since there's five letters in Brother Dwayne's last name, C-R-A-N-E, that each one of them would take a letter and do the scripture, but would apply that, that word with that letter to his name. I've been anxious to hear what these men have to say. <laughs> So the first one I'm going to ask to come up, Brother Don Bodie. Why well, don't uh, we just go ahead and open up in prayer since I'm the first one. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the pastor that you've given to us, Lord, to, to serve beneath, Lord, and to, to lead us. Lord, and we pray for your blessings on him, blessings on Miss Brenda, blessings on their family, Lord. Lord, help them to continue to lead, Lord, and to, to uh, just to give them, give them encouragement, Lord, give them wisdom, Lord, and help us to uh, be that encouragement and be that of wisdom to him as well. Thank you for your blessings and help us as we open your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's always an honor to get to stand up here and uh, just definitely not worthy to be up here and to, to preach God's word, but I thank you for his grace, as Brother Bob just said, and his forgiveness. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse, verse number 3. I got C as my letter, so my... Uh, I went with commander, and 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2, verse 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Um, as Christians, we're soldiers for Jesus Christ, and we're in a spiritual warfare. So very quickly, I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, this message will be motivational for not only Brother Dwayne, but for all of us here today. So... Good Baptist, I've mean, got five minutes, three points real quick. Uh, <laughs> commander. Sure. So in war, you know that there's always a leader that leads the soldiers into battle. Well, here at Bethel Baptist, our leader is Brother Dwayne. And he's led us through many battles. Um, just a couple years I've been here, led, us through me, led me personally through many battles and many victories through it. Amen. Um, and I give thanks to God for giving us such a wonderful spiritual leader. And I believe that most of you would agree. He's a, great, he's a great man of God, and he sets an example that all of us can follow. Uh, just as the commander of an army is responsible for his troops, Brother Dwayne is held responsible for what happens here at Bethel Baptist. Um, I mean, you imagine in war, you know, if, if, the, if the commander leads them, leads them astray or, lead, uh, or does good, he's in charge. He's responsible. He's going to get the reward or he's going to get the punishment for it. I mean, same, same point. Brother Dwayne is held responsible for us here. And uh, I think he does a great job. Amen. But Brother Dwayne, you've been here for 20 years, and, and I'm thankful for the wonderful things you've accomplished. Um, I've only been here a couple, but I've just, just what I've seen, you know, it's been, I mean, I'm truly honored to serve below you and to get to learn from you. But at the same time, I want to encourage you to keep fighting. Your war is not over yet. Our war is not over. The battle's still going. Just keep fighting. Fight harder than you've ever fought before. And to, until you draw your last breath, I, my prayer for you is that you'll lead us into battle and that you'll be an example that we can all follow. So, after, so next, I'm going to talk about the commanded. 
and that's all of us. Friends, we expect our commander to go into the heat of battle. If we're going to expect that, we better be right there behind him. Imagine, imagine a commander running into battle. I mean, and, and like they used to say, you see on the movies or whatever, you know, they yell charge and they run into battle. But imagine if they ran into battle and nobody was behind them. It'd be a little discouraging, wouldn't you think? Well, imagine how Brother Dwayne feels. I mean, I imagine there's been times that he's had to do things on his own because nobody was there. So I want us to, to, to take charge and to, to follow him. I mean, if we're gonna if we're gonna trust him to be our leader, we need to trust him enough to follow him. Um, and imagine how many more battles he'd be encouraged to lead us if we'd just be willing to go. Um, you know, today I know he he's gonna enjoy everything that's done here today. And I thank you, Brother Billy. I thank everybody that's had a part in this. Amen. But you know, it doesn't have to end today. You can continue to encourage him by be willing and be, being willing to follow him into battle and willing to, to do whatever he may ask of you. And, uh, and even if he doesn't ask, do it. You know, if, if there's something you know you can help, do it. And thirdly, I'm, a, I'm the condemned. So to those of you who have never accepted Christ as Savior, I'm just here to tell you that the Bible says you're already condemned to an eternity in hell because of your sins. You're simply not a soldier for Christ because you've never even enlisted. You know, you're still fighting for the wrong side. You know, Matthew 12, 30 says, and this is Jesus speaking, he says, he that is not with me is against me. You're either fighting the battle for Christ and Christ's army, or you're fighting for the devil. It's simple as that. That's hard to say and that's hard to swallow, but that's, that's biblical truth right there. But the good news is it's not too late. You know, I know today's it's a little different. It's, it's We're doing it a little different, but we're still having church here today. I believe souls can still be saved today. I believe that, that uh, uh, lives can be changed today. You know, at some point, I imagine we're going to have an invitation. And if, if you're here today and, and you don't know Christ, it's not too late. If you're here today and, and you've got you got sin in your life, it's not too late. No matter what, be uh, don't wait. List in the Lord's army and, and just fight the good fight. I have to be honest, it's hot, I have to be honest, when, when Billy first mentioned to me about uh, what, what he was thinking and planning to do, he, uh, he said he would like to have some men of the church get up and preach, and, and he mentioned me as being one of those, and then a little while later, like he said, Brother Don came up with the idea of using Brother Crane's last name and each of us taking a letter. And my, my letter is the letter R. And I, I kind of, there was a kind of little misunderstanding, I guess, when he, when he said he wanted us to preach. And like I had mentioned, mentioned to Billy before and, and some others, my, my sum of preaching experience consists of preaching in the jail. My home church had a, had a, jail, had a jail ministry, and I had the privilege of, for many years, preaching in the jailhouse. And, and looking out at this crowd, I think I fit right in. <laughs> I feel kind of comfortable, but but he said we only had five minutes. And, and the Lord started working on me and, and started preparing me and he gave me a message. And uh, after laboring over it and laboring over it, I got it cut down to about an hour and a half. <laughs> and, and then I called Brother Billy Thursday and I said, you know, so we only have five minutes. Just do you expect us to preach in five minutes? And so, uh, so this morning, I kind of switched gears because I couldn't I couldn't narrow it down to five minutes. There's no way. <clears throat> but my letter was R, and the first 
word that came to my mind from scripture was over in Isaiah. And, and like I said, I can't preach that message this morning because there's not enough time. <laughs> but this morning I got to thinking about Brother Crane and, and uh, his uh, service to God. And he'll be the first to tell you that it's not about him, but it's about his God. And what better way to honor a life of service to God but by honoring the God of life, the God who gives life. And so constrained by this time limit, uh, I, uh, I, I narrowed it down, and I, it's not really going to be preaching, per se, a message like Brother Don did, but I've known Brother Dwayne for almost three years now. We, we started visiting uh, around... Thanksgiving Christmas of uh, 2014 and in keeping with the uh, the allotted time I, I got to thinking about scriptures that that uh, describe our pastor or not so much the man but his God and the first one that came to mind was uh, and y'all don't have to turn because we're going to turn several places. But the first first scripture that came to mind was 2 Timothy 1.5. 2 Timothy 1.5 says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also the faith of the Son of God. I believe that that day that Brother Dwayne put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ and to call that into remembrance, that's, that's the most important day of anybody's life. Amen. If, if you live to be 100 years old, and you've never accepted Jesus Christ, then your life's been in vain. Your whole life, your entire life has been in vain. I, I didn't get saved till later in life. I was 34 years old. And the biggest regret thinking about that is those years that were wasted, that I could have been doing something for Christ and but when I'm called into remembrance of the unfeigned faith the faith in Jesus Christ Amen. and I'm persuaded that is in Dwayne Crane as well <clears throat> the uh, second scripture found in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 6. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to dis seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, their conscience being seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God cre hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. 
I believe that Brother Crane reminds us every Sunday and every Wednesday. He puts us in remembrance of God's Word. And this makes him a good minister of Jesus Christ. Because without the Word of God, faith comes, comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. But we must be reminded... We must be put these things in remembrance. As Paul was writing to Timothy, if you do these things, you are a good minister of Jesus Christ. He, he is faithful in putting us in remembrance. So he that makes him a good minister of Jesus Christ. And thirdly, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 17. For this cause have I sent unto you, Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. The Apostle Paul lived in such a way that he could say, do as I do, follow me, because I follow Christ. Can any of us honestly say that? Look at me, watch me. Because I'm like Christ. I believe our pastor comes as close as any of us. Amen. And finally, I know I'm probably over my five minutes. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 8. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to thee remembrance of thee. Like I said, the, the best way to honor this man is to honor his God. A little bit shorter. <clears throat> so we have commander, we have remembrance. I'm going to use action, faith in action, okay? Um, in fact, Brother Crane, would you mind standing up here? <laughs> Don't say, uh-oh, Miss Brenda, would you please as well? Please. Because Pastor Appreciation Day should be part of, you should be part of this as well. Would you mind coming over here? I, and there's a reason. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you a quick story real quick. <laughs> How many of you are familiar with the Battle of Bunkers Hill? Sounds like a long story already, doesn't it? Do you know that the Battle of Bunkers Hill did not happen on Bunkers Hill? Are you aware of that? It happened on a lesser hill called Breed's Hill. But there was a spiritual battle that happened on Bunkers Hill nearby. There was a young man that went to hear a preacher named George Whitfield. He got born again and saved. He later went to Bible college, was called to preach, and passed a church up in Vermont when he heard about what was going on in Concord and Philadelphia and some of the fights with the British. The man's name was David Avery. He immediately resigned his church to become the chaplain of the army. You were talking about being in battle. He immediately resigned his church to become the chaplain of the army and he began marching towards Boston and don't you know 20 of his church men 
followed with him. He didn't ask them. The Battle of Bunker's Hill was fought by a small number of patriots against the entire British Army. They had about 500 people die. The British Army had about 1,000. So in proportion, they actually lost about 70 to 90%. But the amount of casualties inflicted on the British were major. In fact, it's psychologically, the historians believe, is what caused the, the, the British to believe that there was something going on here in Americans. There's something about these American folks, these patriots, there's something different, that they're able to stand up with fortitude against us in some way we can't explain. During the battle on Breed's Hill, we know it's the Battle of Bunker's Hill, that David Avery, that chaplain, stood on the mountain on Bunker's Hill and prayed for help. And a wave of the British would come and kill. And the patriots would begin to run away as, as they're dying. And they'd look back and they'd see the man of God up there praying. And they'd come back again with more energy. They'd get hit again. They'd begin falling off. And again they'd look and they'd come back with more energy. Because the man of God was up there pouring out his heart and praying to God. Physically, we lost that day, but God had a long game going on, and we won. Psychologically, we affected the British that day. Now, if you're not familiar with Exodus, I'm trying to keep this short. <laughs> Listen close. Exodus chapter 17, verse 9, And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose out men and go and fight. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Verse 10, So Joshua did as Moses said unto him. Now this is important in every church. When you have that commander, that leader, we need to do what we're told. We need to listen to the man of God and do what we're told. Amen. Joshua did as Moses said unto him and went and fought against Amalek. And then it says Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. It doesn't say that Moses asked Aaron and Hur to come up to the top of the hill. It doesn't say that. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hands and Israel prevailed. That's right. You're getting it. Some of you other men as well be paying attention. As it came to pass when Moses held up his hands to Israel, uh, uh, to God, Israel prevailed. When he let him down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. You're getting it. You're getting it, brother. Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone, put it under him. Then he'd sit there on. It takes men to gather around the man of God to keep those arms up. Amen. Brother, Brother Billy actually mentioned that as well. And Aaron and Ur stayed his, own, his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Folks, I believe every one of you should be part of staying the man of God's hands. Amen. Every day there's a battle going on. Some, some in the hospital. Thank you, brother. There you go. You're getting it. Listen, she's as much as he is. She's praying for you. You're getting it, aren't you? There's battles going on. And these two are praying for us when we don't realize it. Their life is a life of faith and action. And our staying of their hands and praying with them, praying for them, is our life, our faith and action. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, I, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for the man of God and his wife. 
I pray, Father in heaven, Lord, that you'll bless them every day at this church. Father, help us to find ways to better serve, to help, and to stay their arms. God bless them. Thank you, Father. You call this Pastor Appreciation Day. I suppose that's right. That's what it should be. When I first imagined this, I thought it almost it'd kind of be a little love fest, just loving on the preacher. But we appreciate you, preacher. We appreciate you. God bless you. I'm the M of Crane, and Brother Dwayne is our navigator. First Timothy, chapter two, and verse five. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Wherefore, I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Well, Brother Crane is not an apostle. He's a little bit late for that. But he's a God-called preacher. Amen. I know you love him like I love him. Appreciate him. Well, he is a preacher, and he's a teacher of Gentiles. I think I know most of us. We are all, nearly all Gentiles, and if you're not, you can be one. <laughs> <laughs> but he is our teacher, and he is our preacher. Amen. When Jerry and I moved to Rockwall, we didn't even consider going to another church. Lots of good churches around Walkwall and Garland. We just came to Bethel. Of course, we knew the pastor and his wife and a good deal of the membership. We want to be here. Anybody can be welcome as a first time visitor to the church, but when we first came, we just felt at home. Y'all have made us feel that way. And by and large, it's because we're taught to feel that way. Where the crane welcomes all. It doesn't matter what color folks are. It doesn't matter what nationality they are. They're all welcome. And that's the kind of church we want to be in. And we're so glad to be here. Sister Crane doesn't remember it, but one other time when I was out of the pastor and visiting the church, she said, when is Brother Buddy going to get right with God and join our church? <laughs> and... Uh, so I said that this time. I said, let's don't wait, though. We know the pastor, his stand for God. We know the Bible he uses. We know the folks there. 
and it is truly a New Testament church. And we appreciate so much being a part of Bethel Baptist and having our pastor, our navigator, to guide us through the scriptures. Amen. I count it a privilege, Brother Duane, to stand here, as always, to be called upon to, to fill this pulpit. I have a note here that was put in my Bible, K-I-S-S. -S. Yes. <laughs> it means keep it sh short, something. Thought my I thought my wife put it in there for me. But I think we really know what it means. When a preacher gets that note, we know what it means, don't we? But I do count it a privilege to, to stand here and honor our pastor uh, with the word of God. Um, speaking of not having very much time, they put me last so I could have all the time I wanted. But I only have, that's, that's called repentance. <laughs> Amen, that's repentance, true repentance, I think. I only have five minutes, so I guess I better get to the point. I've known Brother Duane now for approximately 15 years, somewhere in that neighborhood, 15, 17 years, somewhere in that neighborhood. It's a pretty long time, as you may know. But over the years, brother, and uh, I've seen many, many different characteristics of this young individual. From being scared of what's in the dark, <laughs> from being afraid of heights. And no doubt those of you, uh, Sister Nancy and others may have some stories that you'd like to share with us about Brother Dwayne growing up and his scaredness of different things. I'm sure there's some stories, but don't have time, as Brother said. We don't have no time to do that. But you might share those things with us as we're eating. It would be good for us to maybe know that about our pastor. He admits those things, though, but there may be some that he's leaving out. We may want to know. <laughs> Over the years since I have was saved as a teenager to this point in my life, uh, Brother, I've had many different pastors. Thank the Lord that all those pastors have been men of God. And they served the Lord and they loved the Lord and they knew how to pastor a church. You can be a preacher, but pastoring is something different. Amen. It wasn't until we came to this church that I really realized and began to understand what being a pastor really was. I just thought you just stood up and preached, you know, uh, and did those things. But it, it goes further than that. If you were to go to Webster's Dictionary by the word pastor, there should be a picture there of our pastor, Amen. Brother Dwayne. I'm reminded of the story, if you'd like to turn quickly, and I'll not keep you very long, Luke chapter 10. The book of Luke chapter 10, begin reading in verse 25. And I believe this, pa this passage of scripture describes our pastor and I think you'll all agree with me once we read it. Verse 25, and we'll read down through verse 37. It said, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him and departed, 
leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite. By the way, these are two religious individuals. Let me just make that mention. And when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and bound up his wounds pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was the neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then says Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. In this passage of scripture, I can't help but think of an individual of our church that fits the Good Samaritan description. It's our pastor, Brother Dwayne Crane. To this church, Brother Dwayne is a Good Samaritan. There are many and I say many in this church can say without hesitation that he has been a good Samaritan to them. Amen. And for some of us, many times have been that good Samaritan. Amen. The good Samaritan in this passage of scripture becomes an example. By the way, my letter of the word crane is E. Example. Amen. No doubt that this good Samaritan was definitely an example for us to follow. Brother Dwayne being a great example for us to follow. No doubt we could go on and on about the times that he's been there for each of us. From funerals, from finances, being there when your heart was broken, you name it. In the middle of the night, he was there. Why? He even bring gas to a person that runs out of gas. Me. <laughs> That's just one time. Ran out of gas on the highway out here. And only person I could think of was our good Samaritan, our pastor. And he came. Didn't you? Amen. He came. The last letter of his name, E, which I believe stands for in Brother Dwayne, an example. He'll be the first to say not to follow him because he knows he makes mistakes. And he'll lead us sometimes in the wrong direction. But yet the example I want you to see is how he is a good Samaritan to each and every one of us. When it comes to being the neighbor that is spoken here in Luke 10, Brother Duane is a fine and tremendous example of a good Samaritan. One that I would be proud to follow. Brother Duane, I, I thank God that he called you as pastor of Bethel Baptist Church 20 years ago. And, and I thank you today for being that example for us to follow, being our pastor. Keep on pastoring. Amen. We love you. Again, I want to thank everybody that helped put this on, and uh, my. Every time they asked me about this and that, I said, "I want to make this good for him." So it really, just as long as it was, and I think it was. And for my closing remarks, it was really easy. Uh, Grace Ann's the only one that'll probably know what I'm talking about. I wanted to come up with something that that would describe Dwayne and Crane, and this is simply me. But many years ago, when we first came back here, Grace Ann was having surgery, and Brother Dwayne and Sister Brenda was over there every day, really got her through some rough times. But the day I, in question I want to talk about is the, is the first day. It was like any day, you know, that y'all have had these day surgeries. You go over there, you're getting ready, and 
for the things like that and it was a Monday and uh, we were doing that and Brother Dwayne came in the hospital and it really shouldn't he was just that way anyway and didn't think nothing about it but on up in the morning I said something to him I said well I guess you didn't have to work today he says no I, I had to work and so he knew exactly what I was and I looked at him and he said oh don't worry about that it was on the way it was on the way and that's what I want you to remember those five words it was on the way and the reason I say that is because brother Dwayne lived in Mesquite and worked in North Dallas and Grace was in Rowlett Hospital it was on the way you know and that that has described me as Dwayne Crane since I've known him it was on the way and uh, so it was when it was in fact out of the way so brother Dwayne from the folks that love you and please don't fret because what was put together it was on the way would everybody stand please to our visitors to our former members to our uh, family here at Bethel and to his family that's here Please join me and welcome our pastor of 20 years, Brother Dwayne Crane. Wow. First of all, I am unworthy of all the comments and probably very worthy of the accusations. As I stand here before you today, uh, I'm humbled at the comments, so I wonder where some of those pictures came from. It's been an honor, Brother Gary, to take on many roles and many hats, to play different parts. The joy of being around these kids, uh, there are some that are here that I have watched grow from teenage into adult. Their kids now have come along, and we've watched their kids grow. We've had the joy of seeing folks come into the church here and be a part of the church and seeing them grow and some have moved on and, and carried on uh, in their labor and in their service for the Lord but we thank the Lord for each one that the Lord has sent to us along the way and each of you that have, have come and I'll be honest with you uh, I have said and thought many times that when someone comes to Bethel Baptist Church and and to hear my preaching, I'm unworthy that anyone would even return. I am not the great orator. I'm not elegant uh, of speech. Um, I just want to honor the Lord. Amen. You know, one thing that I learned, Brother Billy alluded to, Brother Ramsey, David Meeks, Cheryl Green that just recently passed away and went home to be with the Lord. Howard Neal, others. Um, there have been other men of God that have shaped my life and touched my life. And I think the one thing that has always uh, impressed me was when I saw someone who was a pastor with a shepherd's heart. And that, for that reason, that's one reason why that I have always tried to put Christ as that example because I believe he had a shepherd's heart. And I believe that as a shepherd, it involves caring for the sheep, 
leading the sheep, providing for the sheep, feeding the sheep. Now, I count it an honor to have these men that have stood. And I actually said to someone just not too long ago that God has given me about five or six men that I believe uh, could step up at any point and at any moment, and you heard from them today. Uh, good messages, good thoughts, well developed, put together. And uh, you should have just gone ahead and preached that prison sermon. <laughs> I'd have loved it. Amen. But being a shepherd. It's not being a lord over God's heritage. But as Brother Gary said, it's, it's just being that example to lead. Realizing that if I stumble, the sheep stumble behind me. But you understand it's not about the shepherd. It's about the chief shepherd, the great shepherd. 1 Peter chapter 5 Verse 1 says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. The imagery that Peter gives to us and of this passage, and in fact when I did not know how this was going to work out today, no one ever conferred with me on the agenda. So I did not know what was, I, I honestly, I'd picked up a little pieces here and there of some things, but I had no idea how or what was going to transpire. And when I heard that these men were going to be speaking for five minutes each, I thought to myself, I hope none of them get in my sermon. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But the imagery that Peter gives here is of a shepherd with a heart for the nation of Israel. They had had other examples, great examples, patriarchs, men of God. I've had many, many women that have been examples before me that have taught me. I, I go back even as a boy that uh, Sister Lois Westbury, Nancy, I know you remember her and others of you as well, and we sat in a little storefront building and she took us in a little hallway that had steps and we sat in that as a classroom and she taught us. But beyond that, she taught us by her life. Sister Lois Neal, been a tremendous example through the years. The, the people of Israel, they had had Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and even as Brother Glenn alluded to, uh, to Timothy of, the, of his grandmother and, and uh, his mother and even in, in him and he brought to remembrance and when he said that immediately I went to my grandmother. The example that had been set there and the legacy that had been set there uh, between my, my grandmother, my mom and dad, and, and my family. These men had tended to their shepherds. Moses was a shepherd on the backside of the desert with Jethro's flocks. And Moses worked for 40 years. Uh, and David, the, the, the psalmist of Israel, was a shepherd. And some of the great prophets like Amos were shepherds. 
And the ideal of a shepherd was a goal towards the heart of Israel and, and to have that heart and the imagery uh, that lies, I believe, that ought to be in a, a pastor. And, and, uh, and, and folks, I would much rather the emphasis be on you. But Simon Peter here reminds the elders, the leaders of the church and and as a bishop or as a pastor, and, and I believe that the, these men this morning are, are elders, they're leaders within our church as well, and they, they teach and they, they fulfill other duties and responsibilities, and I am so thankful to have uh, men and women around the church here that do engage and help out. Paul, even in speaking to the church at Ephesus, said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the flock. Amen. The word for shepherd is poemen. The word for tending that flock or feeding that flock is poemen. That word to all the flock, to feed the flock, to shepherd the flock, to tend to the flock, to care for the flock. In fact, it's a precious flock because it's a flock that's been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not just sheep out on a hillside, but it's sheep that have been gathered by the chief shepherd himself. The imagery that the Lord used in speaking to Peter in, in John chapter 21 is as the Lord spoke to Peter and with what was going on in Peter's life and in the midst of turmoil and chaos even in Peter's life, the Lord looked at Peter and just asked him a simple question and he said, Simon, lovest thou me? Simon Peter responded just so casually. He said, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. And again, and then again, and he said, feed my lambs. Simon Peter responded that one time, and he said, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And I believe that the Lord was saying to Peter, Tend the flock. Feed the flock. Care for the flock. Amen. When that good shepherd, he says, shall appear, that when we have honored God in our lives and we have served the Lord in our lives and we have been faithful in this world, and folks, may I say, there is so much turmoil and chaos and, and, and uh, destruction in the world that we live in, but yet the call still comes out to feed the flock. Amen. And he said that when that chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And the Bible talks about five crowns. The Bible talks about in the book of Revelation, it says, Be thou faithful unto death, and you shall receive a crown of life. In 1 Thessalonians 2.19, he speaks of the crown of rejoicing, the soul winner's crown. It's concerning souls that had been won in Thessalonica, the soul winner's crown. Then he speaks of the righteous crown. Paul said, I am now ready to be offered and my departure is at hand and I have fought a good fight and I have kept the faith and I have finished the course and I believe that God calls upon each one of us to, to be righteous in our lives that we might earn that crown of righteousness. Paul said, Hence, there, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord shall give me that day, but not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearance. 
Then I believe in 1 Corinthians 9, 25, there's the victor's crown. Paul said those who strive in the athletic world, they receive a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. And that incorruptible crown is that victor's crown for the one that, that, uh, that, that stays the course. That crown shall never fade away. It's a, a forever crown. And the fifth crown is the one we spoke of here. When the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that shall not fade away. I don't think there's a sweeter saying than that which I read some years ago. Dr. George Truett was a pastor of the First Baptist Church here in Dallas. Baylor University contacted him and inquired him and asked him if he would come and become the chancellor of the Baylor University. Dr. Truett replied this. He said, I have sought I have prayed and I have received a shepherd's heart. Therefore, I must stay in the church that God has placed me. Oh, he could have gone to Baylor and have become even more renowned. He could have gone to Baylor and become recognized for so much more. But he said, my heart is to be a shepherd, to, to care and to tend and to minister to the flock. Peter said there in verse 3, he said, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And I believe it, it, it not only is in the pulpit, but I believe that, that it's also in the pew in that we should be in samples in our lives to a lost and dying world. And I believe there when he talked about being lords over God's heritage, I, I believe that God has given to each one of us a responsibility and he's given to each one of us a ministry and, and that ministry might be in the career field that we were in. That ministry might be in our home and that ministry might be in our community. That ministry may be in the supermarkets or that ministry might be at a service station. But I believe that each one of us are accountable and responsible for being good shepherds of the ministry that God has given to us Amen. and tending to those that may need to hear the gospel or may be hurting and looking for someone to love them and to care about them. And, and, and oftentimes God puts us in the way to be that minister in that person's life. Sometimes we think the clergy or the minister is the man that stands to preach, but I believe that the ministry is in each of our hearts. A teenager in school may be ridiculed or laughed at for honoring and serving God, but I believe God put them in that ministry to preserve, to care, to tend for others. Stephen himself was a deacon and Philip was a deacon and Aquila was a tent maker. But the th fact of the matter is, is that, that uh, throughout each of their lives they were, they were lay people, but those lay people were the ones with, who with the apostles and the, the prophets and the, the pastors that, that combined together, they built the house of the Lord and they could together built the work of the Lord. It wasn't one man in my soul that could not still be one man. Years ago when the Lord called me to preach, I was unworthy then and still unworthy now. And I've wondered many times why God ever chose me. 
But I know this, the Bible even says, What man of you, in Luke 15, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine and go out into the wilderness to seek that which is lost until he find it. And my friend, that, that we ought to pray for a shepherd's heart. That when someone is hurting or someone is broken and someone is in, in, in burden that, that we ourselves would leave the comforts that we have and reach out to someone and minister to someone and love someone and care for them and tend to that flock in the ministry that God has given to each one of us. The shepherd's heart is a seeking heart. Paul wrote to Timothy in chapter 4 and verse 5, and he said, Do the work of an evangelist. And he was referring to the gift that God had given to Timothy. And may I say to us, God has equipped each one of us in his service and in his labor and in his field. He's given to us gifts or talents or abilities to be able to tend to the flock, to minister. To be able to stand and proclaim, to give that word of God. To be able to share that word of God with others. I believe that's, isn't that the chief purpose for coming to church is to prepare us? Right. How many jobs have training whereby it prepares them to perform their jobs. It might be reading, studying. It may be OJT, what we call on-the-job training. We know about some of that on-the-job training, amen? The idea being is that oftentimes we fail to understand that when we come together to worship, what we are doing is we're learning to be able to minister to those in our lives. We're not just going to church to go to church. But we're coming together to teach, to grow, to learn, so that when I go back into my ministry, into my field, at my job, at my home, at my community, that I can carry out my duties. You meet, know people that I would never be able to reach, that I may never ever meet. And he said again, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine out, of the, out in the wilderness and seek for the lost until he found it? Feed the flock. Care for the flock. Tend to the flock. So that when the chief shepherd shall appear, have a heart for ministry. Have a heart seeking until he found that sheep that was lost, that sacrifice. And Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep telling us how that he laid down his life and willingly sacrificed for the flock. God prepares each one of us. And it's a central theme and a central idea that, that we as children of God, we as, as a part of Bethel Baptist Church, That we have a heart as brother Glenn said it's not a heart for the pastor it's a heart for the God of the pastor the God of the flock there's never been anything built that was worth 
the value of the church because nothing has ever been paid for that the, compared to the price that was given, and that was Christ's blood. Brother Scott told the story of Bunker Hill. I think sometimes even as Americas today, we, we are oblivious to the price that has been paid for our freedoms and our liberties. We look back in years past and some 45,000 died in Korea. 30, 40,000 died in Vietnam. Some 450,000 died in World War II. Not to mention those that gave their lives to found our country. But I even found something concerning the state of Texas. We love being in Texas, amen. amen. The great state of Texas. I'm proud to be a Texan. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, is, as I read this book, there was a sentence in the book that just caught my eye. And he said, I believe that Texas, and I quote, I believe that Texas is built upon the shoulders of rangers who have laid down their lives for the state. He said that throughout this country, and you think about it, throughout this country, there are little mounds of earth. of Men and women. who paved the way so that you and I could live in a place called Texas. We hardly think of it now because we have got the glamorous cemeteries and places, but there was a time where when someone died, they just buried them right there. And oftentimes a shallow grave. Sometimes as, as I, since I'd read that, there's times when I see a mound, I wonder if that was where someone gave their life. <coughs> Texas built on the shoulders of men who laid down their lives for the state. And I would say this, I believe our church is built on the shoulders of men and women who have given up their lives. Yeah. Those pastors before me prepared the way and built this church. Not so much the building, but the church. The sacrifice of life that had been given. Those missionaries that have gone out and labored and served. That flock of God that God said feed tend to minister. One man said, as he walked down the street of Dallas, in fact, W.A. Criswell made this comment. He walked down the street of Dallas there on San Jacinto Street and he saw a, a glisten, a glimmer reflecting from one of the windows. And in reality, what it was, it was a stained glass window that had just merely caught the reflection of light. And that refraction of that light caught his eye, caused him to stop and look. But he said immediately in his mind, he remembered one day he had gone before the church and had told the church that there was a need to expand, to grow, and build another building. And they began to try to gather the money for it, and he said that there was a woman that walked up to him and said, Pastor, I don't have any money. She reached and she took a ring from her hand, a diamond ring. And she said, I want to give this 
to the church to sell so that they can use it to help build the building. He said immediately, I said, no, ma'am, no, 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 ma'am, I cannot take your diamond ring. And she said, Pastor, with my heart, I give this to you to use for the gospel that we might have this place. And he took that ring and he gave it to someone within the church and they went and sold it and used the money to help fund that very building. And he thought to himself, that glimmer, that reflection of light could very well have been that diamond. To that I thought of all the times through the years that people have given in sacrifice to Bethel Baptist Church. Many years of hard work. Many days of walking streets covered in sweat. Many late nights. Many years of faithful prayer and service. After working long, hard hours and then still preparing Sunday school lessons and studying. And I could go on. It's not my church. It's the church that Jesus Christ built and gave himself for. And each of you have given portions of your life Somewhere throughout Bethel Baptist Church, there's a reflection of your life in tending to the flock, in caring for the flock. My friend today, we don't know how our life might touch someone else. We don't know how our life might engage, but I can say this. That when the good chief shepherd shall appear, I don't want to be like the book of Daniel describes, I believe it was Belshazzar, that the hands, the handwriting on the wall said, You've been weighed in the balances and been found wanting. I want to be faithful and honoring and serving the Lord. To be able to strive and hopefully one day to be able to receive that crown of glory. Not for mine because I believe whatever crowns we get we will place back at the feet of Jesus and say you are worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Because it's not because of me. It's not because of anything that I've done. It's because of the, the Lamb of God who died and gave Himself so that you and I might have that eternal life. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for the, the funeral video. I thought to myself, I said, I'll just save that and y'all can just play it at my funeral. That'd just, that'd be, that way you wouldn't have to worry about putting, putting anything together. <laughs> What's the purpose of a message like this? To encourage each and every one of us to keep on keeping on. And this shall I do, that I might honor my Lord, Amen. and that I might honor my Savior, who loved and gave himself for me.
And Peter makes this appeal to feed the flock which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, not for what it might benefit me, but he said, but of a ready mind, so that when the chief shepherd comes, we can look back somewhere in our life and know for a surety that we gave our heart to Christ. Know for a surety that, that when that chief shepherd comes, I'm, I'm prepared and ready to meet him there. But knowing that I've been faithful, knowing that I have honored the Lord. Sister Kathy, would you come? <coughs> Wonder if there might be someone today that would say, Brother Dwayne, I want to tend to my flock. I want to care for my flock. Husbands, dads, our flock might be our family that we have to lead and we have to care for. Wives, moms, our flock might be our family as well. To tend to them, to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In our community, in our jobs, whatever it might be. That I would each, each day that I, I would say, Lord, am I tending to the things that I should be? Am I taking care of the flock that you've put in my life? To helping care for those? It might be not only our children, but for some of us it might be our grandchildren too. Tend the flock. Let's stand this morning. If the, if the Lord has spoken to any hearts today, I would simply encourage us to come and just say, Lord, I want to I want to tend to my flock. I want to care for those that you have given under my care. I want to honor you, Lord. I want to serve you, Lord. I want to be faithful. While we sing this song, we could do it now. Amen. To commit and to give ourselves to be faithful while we sing. Would you come? Oh, to Jesus I surrender. That I might be found faithful. Oh, to Him I free. Honor the Lord in my life. Tend the flock. Care for my flock. Trust him in his so that when that chief shepherd comes, I surrender. surrender all. all to thee my blessed Savior all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all how about it today all to Jesus I surrender humbly at his feet I bow Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior whole.